You're listening to WPPMLP in Philadelphia and watching live on Philly Cam TV on Comcast and Verizon. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the People Power Lunch Hour. On today's show, we'll be following up with the organizers from the March on Harrisburg. They'll be reporting back from actions that they took at the state capitol in Harrisburg earlier this year in May and talking about their future initiatives to get money out of politics. I'm joined by Michael Pollack and Emmy DeChico. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of the People Power Lunch Hour. The People Power Lunch Hour is a weekly show broadcast on WPPM and Philly Cam TV to engage its citizens, talk about social movements and local organizing. We'll be right back. We'll hope you'll stay with us. Welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour show here on Philly Cam. Once again, I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. I'm joined in the studio by today's special guests. They are some fierce organizers out of Philadelphia who have been working hard to end corruption and get money out of politics. They are part of the nonprofit organization March on Harrisburg, which aims to educate people, uh, get them involved in uh lobbying and engaging their legislators and they've been trying to pass two bills here in pennsylvania i'm joined here by michael pollock who's the executive director welcome to the show thank you thank you for having me uh tell our listeners a little bit about the march on harrisburg when it got started you know what your mission is and what you've been working on sure thing so March on Harrisburg is a statewide, volunteer-driven, uh, nonpartisan group, and we're working to heal our wounded democracy and to restore trust in the republic. And to accomplish that, we are working to pass three bills right now in Pennsylvania. First one is HB 722, SB 22, which is a bill to end gerrymandering. The second one is House Bill 39 slash Senate Bill 132, and that is a bill to ban unlimited gift giving from anybody to any state legislator. And the third bill we're working on is automatic voter registration. Those are some lofty goals here <laughs> in Pennsylvania. Um, <coughs> Emmy, tell us a little bit about your involvement in the March in Harrisburg and, and how you got involved in this movement. Awesome. Well, I am communications director with March in Harrisburg. Um, we I got involved way back in April of 2015. 16. 2016. <laughs> Um, this Time flies. <laughs> yes. Um, this came out of Democracy Spring, which is a national movement to get money out of politics. They did a march from Philadelphia to D.C., um, and they did nonviolent civil disobedience on the steps of the Capitol every day for a week um, with arrestable actions. Mike and I had connected during the march, um, and while we were sitting in the jail-like holding cell after our arrest, we discussed taking it to the state level. Um, so, a year and a half later, here we are. Um, and since then, we have met with the majority of our House and Senate to speak with these bills. Um, we've gathered co-sponsors on all the bills, bringing HB 722 up to 96 co-sponsors, um, the second most co-sponsored bill that's been introduced without a vote. Um, and we've marched 105 miles from Philadelphia to Harrisburg. And we held three arrestable actions at the Capitol with 20 activists that were arrested last May, trying to get a meeting with State Representative Daryl Metcalf, who is the State Government Committee Chairman, where all three of our bills are currently sitting. Tell us a little bit about the march on Harrisburg, the actual march part, walking from <laughs> Philadelphia all the way to Harrisburg, sometimes in the rain, sometimes on the highway. Um, before when we talked to you, you were getting ready to embark on that adventure. Tell our listeners what it was like on that journey. The march was a, a, a very moving experience. Um, <laughs> we, we set out from Philadelphia. 
We set out from Philadelphia in about 45 degree weather. It was pouring down rain, torrential downpours. It was bitterly cold. And about 75 people came out and marched with us uh, for that first day. And uh, then on the opposite side, the extreme weather really, uh, it, it got quite hot when we reached Lancaster County. It was in uh, about 95, no shade out there. So we really dealt with both ends of the, of the extremes of weather um, in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and ticks. And, and ticks. massive <laughs> Pennsylvania summer ticks. A lot of ticks. A lot <laughs> of ticks. Uh, but the things they don't tell you when you go on a march. Yeah, well, the they, things we didn't prepare for. When you get involved with politics, I mean, you, you just you're, you're setting yourself up to deal with ticks because poly means you know many, and ticks are <laughs> little uh, you know, creatures. Um, and, and it was really moving to to march through these areas and to have people come out and march with us, um, to have local media coverage come out and take pictures and do interviews. Uh, we held a few rallies um, along the way, just in kind of the main street areas of towns like Pottstown and Reading. Um, the hospitality from the churches and other organizations that welcomed us was really um, special and, and, and moving. Uh, people were very excited by what we were doing, and we were really able to rally support along the way and, and really kind of raise a, a ruckus for democracy. So then you arrived in Harrisburg, and that's when the real fun began. <laughs> uh, there were three actions. Let's start off with um, five, oh, there was five, five actions. Five actions. There are many, many, many actions. <laughs> There's actions. Uh, let's start out with some of the ones that occurred in the, in <coughs> the actual uh, state house buildings or capitol buildings. Uh, there was a sit-in. And was that at Metcalf's office as well? So we did. Um, I'll just kind of take take us through the through that week. Uh, sure. <laughs> of of um, starting Monday, May twenty May twenty second in Harrisburg in the state capitol, we were there at uh, ten o'clock in the morning. All of us were gathered outside of Representative Metcalf's office, and at ten o'clock in the morning that that day, Representative Metcalf was holding his annual uh, Second Amendment rally, which was titled "Make the Second Amendment Great Again." And so we had some people um, on the second floor of the rotunda with a large banner. And at 10.26 a.m., uh, they were given the signal, and the banner fell, and the banner said, Make Corruption Illegal, March on Harrisburg. The four people who dropped that banner were promptly arrested by Capitol Police. At 11.05 a.m., uh, a sit-in began outside of uh, Representative Metcalf's office. Um, eight people were arrested there. Our request was quite simple and straightforward. We just wanted a meeting. Uh, we just wanted to sit down and talk with him about um, HB 39 and HB 722, our gift ban bill and our bill to end gerrymandering. And um, actually about, th so that was when I was arrested at the 11 o'clock action. And um, I actually challenged it in court and was uh, found not guilty of exactly what I had done and set out to do. Uh, <laughs> but the judge was, was quite merciful and, and lenient there. Uh, and then so right after that, at 12 o'clock was the third action, and that was out inside of the state government committee hearing uh, that was taking place on the other side of the Capitol complex. And there, I believe, 12 people were arrested uh, for disrupting the um, Representative Metcalf's committee hearing, really just asking him for a vote. And what was really striking about that arrest was the amount of support from legislators on the state government committee. There were a few who actually applauded our actions that, that afternoon. Um, and then so Tuesday, uh, the next day of our actions, we actually were able to get five people into Representative Daryl Metcalf's office to ask for a meeting face to face. Um, it took a lot of, a lo a lot of scheming uh, to really get into his office because there was a wall of police between us and him that entire week. He was surrounding himself with a, a phalanx of police officers which really stood out um, and was so ridiculous to the point that another legislator told us it's a really sad and sorry state of affairs when the biggest ass in the building has a police escort wherever he goes. Um, he was really, he was afraid of us for some reason. Um, even though we tried to meet with him civilly for three months, we're not really threatening people. Because <coughs> we, we're, we're so all, intimidating. Right, we're all committed to nonviolence. Um, but he was, he was avoiding us uh, very um, purposefully. And then Wednesday, uh, we did a non-arrestable action outside of his office where we gave him some gifts. Um, we gave him a coffee mug so that he can kind of wake up to the state of our state. We gave him uh, some purple nonpartisan flowers. We gave him a cake because we're just sweet people who want to break bread with him. These are all items of low economic value that would still be allowed under our gift ban bill as well. Um, and then I, I gave him uh, my undershirt uh, because what else did we have to give but the shirt off our backs? Um, because we can't afford to give gifts like other lobbyists are able to give. We can't give expensive vacations, tickets to Eagles games, cash. We, we just can't afford to do that. The idea being that at this point, 
as an organization, we had done every traditional route of getting a bill passed. You know, we had lobbied repeatedly. We had met with the majority of legislators of the House. Um, we had marched. We had done arrestable actions. Um, and it just so for, sort of felt like, well, if gifts is the last avenue we can go to get the attention of this committee chairman, let's try that. Um, and then we proceeded to continue to poke a little fun at him and send him gifts for the next 39 days or so. Um, you should send him like a pajama gram. Well, actually, some people we had some people we had people send in photos. And we had people send in baby toys because he had called us five year olds, um, uh, two year olds, two year olds. <laughs> um, I personally sent him a bar, a couple bars of soap every day um, to remind him to clean up Pennsylvania's act. Um, so things like that. So um, on your website, you have a whole section on nonviolent civil disobedience. And it says the goal of nonviolent direct action is to force an encounter between you and your <coughs> government. It's to lovingly confront our public servants and insist that they see themselves as human beings obligated to serve the pub public and that we are human beings who deserve to more fairly participate in making the collective decisions that govern our lives. We insist that they love us and serve us. Can you talk more about that? Sure thing. Um, this actually came up a whole lot this past week when we were lobbying, because since our actions in May, uh, legislators have really been thinking about us. We, we've been on their mind. And this week, uh, we had to deal a lot with um, reactions to our nonviolent direct actions and really explaining them and, and fleshing them out. So the idea is, um, th the core idea is that when a human being sees another human being in an open and honest way, that their natural reaction is service that when you see the face of the other, you are ordered and ordained to serve the, the other. And we feel like the problem in our society right now is that nobody is really seeing anybody and that our public leaders, our, our public officials, don't actually see the, the constituents that they represent and vice versa. Um, constituents don't interact with their government and, and don't really claim responsibility for their government. Um, so when we force the encounter, we're really trying to force a reaction of responsibility. Um, so that people can see each other and, and respond to each other. And when we do this, the, the natural, the, the reason why nonviolent direct action is so confrontational and dramatic is because it's easy for us to avoid the other. Um, and, and most of us spend our entire lives avoiding the face of the other so that we don't have to take responsibility. And people like uh, Representative Daryl Metcalf are, are very able to avoid citizens and constituents and just avoid the problems that, that face us all. Because it's easy when you're writing letters and emails and calling to, to dodge your constituents and not be accountable to them. But when they're camped out in your office, you really can't avoid them any longer. You, you cannot avoid the truth. Um, and, and when that truth is right in your face again and again and again and again, you can't avoid it. And the, the reaction that we're seeing in the state legislature is, um, is this. So, for example, uh, we met with Representative Samuelson last week. And he began by saying... Co-sponsor, co-introducer of HB 722. He's been working on redistricting for a very long time. And it, he was furious with us. Uh, he, he screamed at us and, and said, you know, why did you do this? This was so stupid of you. Why would you do something so stupid? You're hurting this bill. And I kind of had to step back and say, Representative Samuelson, you've introduced this bill every session for the last 12 years, and it's never gone anywhere. And we don't think that we're hurting it. We think that we're helping it by keeping this issue in the spotlight, by forcing it into the headlines, and most importantly, by forcing it onto Representative Metcalf's agenda. Because he's been saying for years now that nobody cares about gerrymandering, nobody cares about gifts, and we're really just putting it in front of him and showing him that people do care so that he then has to care. It's interesting that they would think that um, a nonviolent, peaceful demonstration is... It's damaging, you know, um, especially since your arrest was thrown out of court, you know, and, and not a legal <laughs> arrest, right? Um, I always find that perspective interesting from legislators. Again, you know, so many bills are introduced. They never see the day of light. They die in committee. They never make it on the agenda in the committee. They never get voted on or even discussed. And a lot of people don't understand that decision-making process. Like, you know, for a lot of people, you know, uh, a time when uh, I had gone with some people to City Hall to get a resolution um, passed, it, you know, they wouldn't even uh, put it on or it was on the agenda, but they tabled it and said, like, we're not going to talk about it and we're not going to vote on it. And it's and P.S. It's never going to come up for a vote <laughs> and it's never going to be discussed. And, you know, 
having knowing how that goes, I was like, oh, well, you know, that's that's typical. But a lot of people were shocked. They were like, what do you mean that, you know, it doesn't it doesn't come up for a vote. It doesn't get discussed. And I was like, yeah, I hate to tell you, but, you know, unfortunately, with so many bills that are introduced by by good Congress men and women, they they don't ever go anywhere. That's extremely common. Um, most, most, most bills do not go anywhere in Harrisburg or in D.C. for that matter or in Philadelphia. And it's I, I just to uh, say one more thing about the nonviolence. Um, when we met with Representative Samuelson, by the end of the meeting, it was extremely respectful and, and even friendly. And the reason was because we were able to say to him, um, you know, through our nonviolence, we kept this in the headlines. And then he said, but everybody you tried to move has responded with anger and, and frustration, specifically Representative Metcalf, and, and threats as well. And that's, that's a really important point to make about nonviolent direct action is that it provokes, and that when you do it, people will respond with every single reason why they shouldn't have to deal with the truthful matter that you put right in front of them. And those rationalizations will be incredibly absurd, and they'll respond with threats, and they'll respond with even violence sometimes. Um, but the crucial point is that you keep putting that in front of them and, and make them deal with it. And so we said to Representative Samuelson, I'm, I'm sure you've gotten threats from, especially from Representative Metcalf over this bill and, and over our actions. And please, if you have to disown us for the moment and, and distance yourself from us for the moment, because we understand that that is the natural reaction. It's, it's almost even a healthy reaction from, from people when they are so challenged with something that is so, so important. We're talking about like sit-ins and like banner drops yeah. and like going to meetings. I mean, that's, yes. I mean, again, nonviolent direct action. I mean, it can be many things, but that's like what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a shame that they, they feel so threatened by these things that seem rather innocuous in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. I think that per our conversation with Samuelson and some of the other legislators that are intimidated or frightened by the idea of these nonviolent, small scale direct actions. Um, everyone has a role to play, you know, and I understand that legislators shy away from that. But for those who are working on something not nearly as long as Samuelson may have been, but for years and who are dedicated to moving this and who have in a lot of ways pushed re this, you know, push 722 and SB 22 from going nowhere to now being in the headlines almost every single day, even just this week, with a very clear target in mind, um, it shows the level of sacrifice that we're also willing to put out. Um, Nonviolent direct action is about putting your body on the line, you know, and having and adding that element of sacrifice beyond just the cause and even beyond just the marching. It's willingness to interact with police, you know, and put yourselves in a somewhat vulnerable position, though at the state capitol it's not nearly as dangerous as other actions like capitol police you know now every time we go for our lobbying days they ask us what's going on today are we going to be running around today and we're like we'll see you know we'll let you know <laughs> well it's good that you you haven't had bad encounters but it's true you know those type of actions aren't nearly the same as say when you know there are people dressed in all black or people who have masks on their face or people who are protesting Nazis, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk uh, about your upcoming events and, and your continuation of this strategy to garner attention. Tell us what's next for you and what you've been up to over the summer since the last um, you know week of actions. Sure thing. Uh, so over the summer, <laughs> I would say that after our May campaign finished up, June was spent mostly asleep and just kind of reflecting on, on what we had done. Um, and then start, we started planning for the 2.0 campaign. So right now we're in the middle of our, our 2.0 campaign. Uh, we are lobbying um, all 15 House session days in September and October. So the first session week was last week. Uh, we'll be back in the Capitol this Monday. Um, and then in November, from November 10th to the 12th, we're marching 36 miles and three days from Lancaster to Harrisburg. And then we have uh, two days of rallies in the state capitol, Monday, November 13th, and Tuesday, November 14th. And those rallies will feature uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, most likely targeted at Representative uh, Daryl Metcalf once again. And again, he is uh, the chair of the state governance committee. Government right. committee, yes, where all of the bills currently lie. Um, Metcalf has a 
specific reputation in the entirety of the Capitol, um, even with staff. He has a reputation for being incredible, incredibly difficult to work with. Um, he A bully. Yes, a bully would be the best way to put yeah. it. Um, he does not work with Democrats. You know, he barely works within his own party. He works with a very specific group of people. Um, and what he says goes, and he doesn't want to hear anything else. And where's so, he from? So he's, he's Butler from County. Uh, Butler so he's County. He's not from Philly. <laughs> no, no, no. No. He's from uh, so, so. Butler County. He's up north. Mm-hmm. Cranberry so, Township. It's yeah. like just north of Pittsburgh. Yeah. So l- l- last week when we were lobbying, uh, he, he wasn't there in the building. Um, he was on an undefined and undetermined leave of absence. His secretary said, we don't know why he's gone and we don't know when he's coming <laughs> back. But to give you an idea of just kind of h- how he's perceived in the Capitol, um, while he was gone, we asked the question, what happens when a committee chairman goes missing? You know, you can't just stop the business of the state. And so we did some research and figured out who replaces him. And then when I went around Wednesday afternoon to a bunch of his friends and let them all know that there was a way to replace him on the committee and that there was a way to just for one day call a committee hearing and just turn the spigot on and get all of your favorite bills through in just one day while, while Metcalf isn't here. And they all said the same thing. And these, these are his friends on the committee. They all said, huh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, that'd be great. No, we can't do that. Daryl will kill us. We can't, we can't do that. He'll, he'll retaliate. Uh, you remember what happened to those two Republicans two years ago who voted with the Democrats that one time, right? They got kicked off the committee. Or you remember what happened to that one person who challenged Daryl four years ago and then got primaried. So they all have stories of times when uh, Representative Metcalf has used intimidation tactics to really get his way. And the way he operates in the state government committee is, is really like a dictator. Uh, he really has near total control over that committee. He's handpicked the, uh, the people who surround him. If anybody challenges him, they're, they're gone. Uh, there's many moments when he doesn't let other committee members ask questions during hearings. He very much limits who's able to testify. And so his committee is really, um, you know, t- talking with a, a few uh, Democrats on that committee, they, they see their job as disaster mitigation. They see their job as what can we do every day to make sure that he doesn't do everything he's trying to do, which would just lead to total disaster. And there's even a few Republicans on the committee who feel that way as well. Uh, he's, he's really up to, uh, up to no good in, in that committee. Well, it seems difficult to get work done when the party is so divided, when there's political consequences, when people are accepting gifts. Doesn't sound very democratic. mm They're shaking their heads for all our radio (laughs) listeners. They're shaking their heads in disapproval. Um, Well, we will definitely have to check in with you again closer to November to see how the march goes and how those actions go. And we might need to bail you out or (laughs) send (laughs) bail funds, but um, we hope everything goes well. Um, I want to talk more specifically about the bills that you're proposing to keep um, our listeners and viewers informed about what they are and like what they intend to do. <clears throat> uh, you talked about redistricting, but a lot of people call it gerrymandering. Uh, I think the last time we were here, we talked about the Philadelphia District 1. We pulled it up on a map. It looks like a crazy looking puzzle piece. I think we call it an oddly shaped amoeba. I mean, it doesn't really uh, seem to make a whole lot of sense. So could one of you elaborate on gerrymandering, redistricting, uh, what that all means, and what this specific bill is calling for? Sure. Um, So SB 22 and HB 722 both would change the way that we redistrict congressional and state district lines. Um, It would take that power out of legislators and incumbents' hands. and put it into a citizen commission. That citizen commission would be made up of 11 individuals, um, four of the largest party, four of the second largest party, so four Republicans, four Democrats, and three independents. Um, to be on the commission, you would have to apply um, via online, You know, fill out essay questions. You'd be then vetted by the Secretary of the Commonwealth. Um, the bill specifically prohibits anyone who is who has been um, a paid lobbyist within the past five years, who has been a legislator within the past five years, or is married to a legislator or a lobbyist um, to avoid those sort of conflicts of interest. Um, Again, the legislation also would prohibit drawing lines based off of any other demographics other than population and county demographics. Um, So no use of 
Mapitude or any of the other software that allows you look, to look into voter preferences, um, not just politically, but you know, socially, what magazines you're reading, all those things um, in which you're able to tap into now. Um, gerrymandering, as it's been coming, you know, more and more known in the news, is often said, you know, legislators often say, well, we've always, you know, it's always been gerrymandered. Or you can never take all of the politics out of this process. These are some of the things that we hear. But while, yes, gerrymandered has, gerrymandering has been around since the early 1800s, it's never ne been nearly this bad. Um, and that's because of data mining and advances in technology and the amount of money that's now pouring into state races um, like they really never had before 2008. Um, and additionally, while, yes, you may never be able to take all of the politics out of something that is political, um, an independent citizen commission would be one of the most independent ways to do that. Um, what's interesting when speaking with Senator Fulmer's office, um, we were going through the bill, you know, we spent an hour or so discussing the legislation, exactly how it would work. And he did mention, you know, there's a lot of other redistricting bills that have been introduced or are floating around the House and Senate. Why, why aren't we seeing such a rise in um, citizen advocating for any of these other bills. And then he answered his own question and said, well, maybe because it's the most independent and citizen powered. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's it. Um, right, so, yeah. because, you know, it's it's hard to trust a bill about redistricting, you know, that has been driven by a legislator who <laughs> probably could benefit from that. Exactly. This takes the hands out of legislators and into citizens. Um, so that's gerrymandering in the... You want to oh, yeah, what, one more thing about gerrymandering. Um, just a few stats worth worth mentioning. Uh, yeah. in, in Pennsylvania, um, one party won 51 percent of total congressional votes statewide in 2012, and then the other party won 13 out of our 18 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. So the losers ended up winning 13 to five. That's one of the effects of gerrymandering. And another way that gerrymandering really operates, um, and th this is really insidious, is that it's a weapon within the legislature, and it's a weapon that party leadership holds over the head of the rank and file. And everybody in the legislature has a story of a colleague who got drawn out of their own district. And it's nearly common knowledge that Speaker Terzai keeps a, uh, they call it the naughty and nice list. And if you're on the naughty list in 2021 when they redistrict, if you live in one place and your district is this area, all of a sudden your district is going to be that area. And you're going to be drawn out of your district and too bad. And this is really one of the major things that hangs over the heads of the rank and file membership and keeps them in line. And it keeps the same people in power, too, if, if they want that to be. It makes mm -hmm. it hard to challenge these incumbents. No question. Gerrymandering absolutely favors the incumbents, and it also favors hyper-partisan incumbents. It, it pressures legislators to move toward the extremes within their own party, and then when they get to Harrisburg, they have no... They really, uh, it, it really limits the desire to even compromise. It, it limits the desire to even work together, knowing that you can just go home to your district and get reelected because your district is all members of your own party. And in fact, they, what they hate more than anything else is the other party. So if you come back to your district with the message of, I tried really hard to push the other party back, um, and that's what I'm doing, you're going to get reelected. And then you end up with a building full of people who are engaged in trench warfare with the other party. And they're really just fighting to push the other party back a few inches here and a few inches there. And they're lobbing rocks at each other and stones at each other. And they don't really realize that at the end of the day, they're still engaged in trench warfare where nobody wins. Yeah, on the Philadelphia map, I see some like very odd things where you have this like mix of like, like, you know, rural urban with some cities in there, some urban stuff in there. And I, you know, when I think of like rural versus urban issues, like they're really different in Pennsylvania, especially uh, because like the culture and the demographic is, is really different. Um, you know, between our, or sorry, between Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia, you know, like <laughs> the, the towns along the way are, are really different. They have different issues. Um, you know, one of them being like, you know, there are areas in Pennsylvania that are really dealing with fracking, for example, which is maybe not something in Philadelphia that um, is, you know, directly impact, although our water is affected, but our land is not being fracked upon. So I guess my question is like, how can people, um, 
you know, represent these communities, right? If they're only being included in the district because of the way that they vote or their socioeconomic status, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to have one person representing these areas that are only chosen, like, you know, like we're in their district only because of the way we vote and maybe our, our race and demographic. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's not necessarily like we're all in the same community facing the same issues and therefore we need somebody to represent us. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. And, and a good example of that is the city of Reading. City of Reading has four representatives. Um, it's carved into four quarters and four districts that reach out into the suburbs and then into the rural areas. So what you have is four people who are tasked with representing Reading, and none of these four representatives actually live in Reading. They all live in the rural areas. And so nobody is actually representing Reading. And one of the side effects of this is that Reading has one of the most unequal school funding uh, systems in the country. Um, because all the resources just get drawn out into the suburbs and the rural area. And it's not, I, I don't want to blame the representatives who represent Reading. Um, they're, I've, I've met all of them, and they're, they're all pretty decent people. They just don't know what happens in Reading. They're, they're just not, they don't live there. They're not aware. Um, one of the representatives of Reading is, is uh, Representative Gillen. And the first time I met him, he had just delivered a baby alpaca on his farm. Like, an alpaca farmer doesn't know what's going on in downtown Reading. Which is a mostly, like, Latino population. It's almost 50% at yeah. this point. Yeah. So, again, it just makes sense, like, why isn't Reading its own district? It should be. These are the questions <laughs> yes. I bet you're asking, right? <laughs> but, um, and, and to go to the natural gas industry, uh, the natural gas industry, gerrymandering affects that, of course. What really affects them, wh how they really operate in Harrisburg, brings us to our second bill, the gift ban. The natural gas industry has 203 lobbyists in Harrisburg. That's one for every state rep. It's an exact one-to-one -one ratio, and that's very intentional. And these 203 lobbyists are able to gift anything they want to anybody in that building, and they do. And we know that they expense about seven to eight million dollars a year in lobbying expenses. And that's a large outside of campaign donations. That's just in gifts, transportation, and hospitality. Wow. They become your and best that's friend. What's, that's what's on record, right? You know, because there's probably a lot of things that are not accounted for. That's on record, and it took Representative Vitali's office seven months to compile the research. <laughs> wow. All right, I want you to hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll talk more about. Uh, the other bill on uh, gift bans and, and how that works. Um, you're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour on WPPM 106.5 FM and watching live on Philly Cam TV. I'm here with organizers from the March on Harrisburg. When we come back, we'll talk more with them about their organizing efforts to get money out of politics in PA. We'll be right back.
right. Welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. And on today's show, we are speaking with organizers from the March on Harrisburg here in PA. I'm here with Michael Pollack, who's the executive director, and Emmy DiCicco, <laughs> who is the communications director. And they've been talking about some of the direct action organizing that they've been engaged in uh, with their group and also some of the legislative initiatives that they have. We were just talking about gerrymandering and trying to fix the problem that we have here in Pennsylvania with the unfair and undemocratic uh, districting that currently goes on. And we were just getting into a conversation about how natural gas drillers and fracking um, has influence over our legislators because of the sheer amount of lobbyists they have in Harrisburg and the seemingly unlimited resources they have to spend on lobbying and gifts. Uh, can you talk more about that and how that relates to the gift ban specifically and what your bill proposes to do? Sure thing. Uh, when you are a legislator <coughs> in the state capitol, it is incredibly easy to get um, really anything you want. You can get tickets to the Penn State game. You can get fancy dinners. You can get wined and dined. You can get an Italian vacation. You can get a vacation to New Zealand. You can get tuition payments for your kids' uh, private school, really anything. And you know who to go to for those things. Um, everybody knows that this lobbyist on this hallway can get you the best Penn State tickets, and that one will take you and your family to Hershey Park. Uh, and, and legislators really have a cozy relationship with lobbyists, um, and lobbyists are really able to gift them anything. And what that turns into is just endless vacations, endless sports tickets, uh, endless dinners. You know, we had a representative last week who said, oh, I, I go to about 50 dinners a year, but they don't affect me. And there's just no way that you can go to 50 dinners with lobbyists when they're paying for everything. And I should also add, they, they tend to get pretty drunk at these dinners. We hear a lot of stories about legislators who just lose themselves at these dinners and just get wasted on the, you know, on the lobbyist time. Well, but more importantly, they're getting time, right? When you oh, yeah. are yes. writing letters and calling and trying to arrange meetings and really engage, you know, these legislators, they're out having dinner that's paid for by lobbyists because that's really why they're doing it, right? They're trying to wine and dine them and, you know, talk them into doing something that benefits them. Build relationships with them. Yeah, uh, uh, totally. Build relationships with them and, and get to know them. Um, and when you know, there, there's no such thing as a free lunch, uh, and there's certainly no such thing as a free lunch and a free dinner five nights a week, and then a free you know football game on the weekends. And it's it's a culture. It's it's a system that really encourages people, legislators, to take these gifts and to go out and really become buddy buddy with the lobbyists because the lobbyists hold a lot of power. They're, they're able to really dictate how effective you're going to be as a legislator. Are you going to get bills heard? Are you going to be on the committees that you want to be on? And they're also really able to affect your election. Uh, they could either fund you or they could fund your opponent. And it's really, th there's so many pressures to participate in this culture of corruption that there are a few people who don't. Um, and it's really a heroic effort on their part because they're, they're really swimming upstream against a very powerful current of corruption. Uh, an example, um, Representative Tom Mert is a Republican from the Willow Grove area, and he was first elected in 2006, and between his election and his first day in office, he, he received an envelope in the mail that had Philadelphia Eagles tickets for that Sunday, and they were the best possible tickets, free food, free parking, sideline passes, r just everything you could possibly want in a, in a football game. And he put the uh, tickets back in the envelope and sent them back with a note that said, please make an appointment in my office. That's where I do business. And the person who sent him these tickets was a very wealthy developer in his district who was a big donor to not only Mert's predecessor, but to the Republican Party statewide. And so once Mert sent these tickets back, um, this donor obviously felt, you know, felt slighted that they weren't receiving the privileged access to a legislator that they felt entitled to and stopped giving money uh, first to Mert and then to the, s the party statewide. And because this happened, um, the party leadership in Harrisburg was furious with him. And they decided that any bill his name is on, they're going to kill. And that's exactly what they've done for the past 12 years now. Um, Representative Mert, got into public service. He's, I should say, he's, you know, he served uh, three tours of duty in Iraq. He's, he's really a stand-up human being. 
And he got into public service because he cares about adults with disabilities and veterans with disabilities and, and providing a, a social safety net for them. And he's been absolutely unable to move his bills uh, since he's entered. He does not get the committee assignments that he wants, and he's, he's totally marginalized within the legislature. And there are plenty of people like that who just refuse to give up their integrity, and so then they had to be marginalized. Suffer the consequences. <laughs> and, you know, this is notorious in New Jersey, New York, I mean, D.C., all over the country. This isn't something that's unique to Pennsylvania. I mean, this is happening all over the country. I mean, how many billions of dollars are being spent each year? I will say that Pennsylvania is one of only 10 states that has no limit on what you can gift legislators. The majority of other states do have at least some sort of gift legislation in place that somewhat prevents it. Um, so Pennsylvania is somewhat more corrupt than the majority of other states in other country. But yes, billions of dollars are being spent, particularly in Congress, but also in state houses. And this is precisely what got Seth Williams in trouble. Take, exactly. Taking gifts, you know, he was taking no. vacations. Not reporting gifts is what got yes. Seth Williams oh, in trouble. Okay. You're allowed to take $150,000 a year in gifts. You just have to report it. Yeah, so this, the problem is a lot of times, again, when we speak with legislators, something that they'll come back with is, you know, the bad guys will get weeded out. You know, they'll end up in orange. Um, but what we're really talking about is something that's completely legal. It's not illegal to accept those football tickets. You know, it's not any, it's not technically under Pennsylvania's code of ethics unethical to do so. Um, so that's what HB 39 would do, and SB 132 would make it illegal to accept these gifts to make it unethical. And then if you were to accept gifts after this legislation was put in place, you would be in trouble. Um, now you said it would be legal for them to get smaller gifts like cake. Items of nominal value. Um, so something that as constituents of Pennsylvania, we would not feel uncomfortable with legislators accepting. Um, so the legislation specifically names under items of nominal value, mugs, t-shirts, pens, empty tote bags. Uh, so it's like merch, like your standard yeah. swag exactly. bag yes. stuff. That, like a nonprofit would give out, you know, exactly. at a health fair. Okay. They, they all talk about, oh, I want to be able to take the shirt when I visit the elementary school, you know, take the T-shirt with the mascot on it or, or accept the uh, the plaque from the local university who, who decides to honor me. And that stuff's okay. Mm. That, no one's going to get too corrupted when, you know, grandma brings an apple pie in for the legislator. Like, that's... But envelopes of cash. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's a different story. It is, it is a little mind-blowing, though, right? Like that you can give a legislator yeah. in Pennsylvania an envelope full of cash. With as like as a long wink, as you report it. With a <laughs> wink and a nod uh, for what you want them to do. You said earlier that, because I joked, well, maybe people should start a Kickstarter or GoFundMe, you know, for, for bribes. You know, jokingly, I said that, but you said somebody had, had done that with uh, uh, Senator Toomey. So, so the way bribery laws currently operate in the U.S. is that for it to be considered a bribe, I have to say, I am giving you this item or this dollar amount, and you are going to do action Y in return for me offering item X. And then you have to accept my offer and say, yes, I am taking your offer in order to do this action, which you are paying me to do. And that legal formula never happens in normal conversation. <laughs> People don't say that when they're giving each other gifts or campaign contributions. So Senator, to there was a Kickstarter effort uh, regarding Senator Toomey. I think it was to raise $42,000. Um, he, had, he had taken something like that amount of money from the pharmaceutical industry. And so somebody was trying to kind of buy his vote on a, on a pharma bill. Um, and they had to write in the Kickstarter, you know, this is satire. Um, because to raise money to influence Senator Toomey, you know, that specifically um, is, is a felony. You're, you're soliciting a bribe or you're participating in, in bribery. Um, so they had to write this is a felony. But when uh, a lobbyist for the natural gas industry goes into Harrisburg and cuts a big check, they, they don't need to say, you know, this is a joke or this is satire because it's not to them. Um, it's, it's very real to them. They're giving a check and they're expecting something in return. So what, what do they get in return? Um, in, in Pennsylvania, the natural gas industry, again, they have 203 lobbyists. They expense whatever it is. They wine and dine everybody. And I really mean everybody across party lines. 
Um, and so, and you see the results of that play out. Pennsylvania is the only state that has no tax on its on its fracking profits, which is just absurdly ridiculous, especially since we're about to default on our on our everything. Um, and Pennsylvania has no regulations regarding drilling new wells. We put workers in peril every day. We put the environment in peril every single day. And to top it all off, Pennsylvania, as a state, we are responsible for 1% of the world's greenhouse gases. 1% of the world's greenhouse gases. And that is able to happen because the natural gas industry has so bought and corrupted the state legislature that they're able to just get their way and, and really do dangerous things for not just Pennsylvania, but for the world. And I will say that while legislators have been debating a minuscule severance tax this round on natural gas. There's no debate about whether or not they're going to institute a gross receipts tax on utilities. Um, so instead of instituting a fair severance tax on the natural gas industry, they're instituting, if this budget were to ever pass, a tax on our gas usage. So your utilities will go up if you live in Pennsylvania, but natural gas frackers will not be paying a fair severance tax. <laughs> And a lot of them are not based in Pennsylvania. They're out-of-state companies mm -hmm. that come in. And as we've seen in other states, they set up shop, they drill until they can drill no more, and then they leave and they just abandon the sites. And then you have these like toxic sites across the state. It's like that in Wyoming and, and other parts of um, the Midwest. Uh, and yet they they have so much power and influence to get away with that. This. It, <laughs> this is not a totally clean or, or fair comparison, um, but being in Pennsylvania now, you know, I, I remember growing up and reading stories of what was happening in Nigeria in the 90s and early 2000s, and, and you had these large multinational companies coming into that country and just drilling everywhere, taking everything out, none of the profits staying behind with, with the locals, um, and everything really being exported to trade on the international market. And that's what's happening in Pennsylvania right now. You have just reckless environmental destruction. Um, none of the money that's that's being generated is actually staying with the locals in Pennsylvania. And all of this natural gas is th the goal is to build pipelines to get it to international export. And we're we're seeing it in Lancaster right now, where they're trying to build one of these pipelines, which, by the way, is really being um, rubber stamped and and the wheels have been properly ge greased by the industry to get this pipeline through. And people are, aren't going to take it. Um, Lancaster stands up and Lancaster Against Pipelines are out there right now. And they're putting their bodies on the line. And they're really going to be doing that, uh, really ratcheting that up as this pipeline construction begins. And we're going to see state violence um, against them to really get this pipeline up and going. Um, so I, I, it really feels like we're kind of in a, a Nigeria situation before it got really bad. Um, companies are coming in and just stealing everything and using violence so that to really get that done. Yeah, and, and they're trying to pass a law that's aimed towards those protesters. Oh, Senator Scott Martin from Lancaster who came into the state capitol directly from natural gas lobbying. Yep. So he was working under, he was a within a firm that was hired by natural gas lobbyists and then was elected. They helped fund his campaign, and now he introduces legislation that directly targets um, pipeline protesters, but all protesters, really. It was our picture in the papers with that bill, but he was really aiming at the Lancaster Stands Up people um, because he, he knows, and, and, and this is just what's going to happen, it's going to be Standing Rock Round 2 in Lancaster in the fall and into the winter, um, and he's really trying to end it before it begins, a, as he's been trying to do this whole time. He, he's an inside man. I mean, he's he's a fracking lobbyist who is now a senator pushing through fracking pipelines. Sounds like uh, our Secretary of State. <laughs> Rex, I mean, like so many, I mean, let's be yeah. honest here, like so many of the cabinet positions and even the FCC chair, you know, who was also a former Verizon attorney and lobbyist, like a lot of them have been later, you know, gotten positions in government or become legislators. I mean, isn't that a bit problematic? I, was, I mean, yeah, you see their revolving door in nationally, um, but also in Pennsylvania. I mean, there's plenty of lobbyists um, that come or who are related to individuals that come in um, the gaming board. Um, two casino lobbyists are on the gaming board most recently. Um, the uh, Senator Scarnati's chief of staff sister was named to this gaming board. It's a $145,000 a year position. 
and her sister is a casino lobbyist and her um, rebuttal against the fact that it would be a conflict of interest was that, well, the only casino lobbyist I know is my sister, so it won't be an issue. And that was her argument against there being any sort of conflict of interest there, aside from being, you know, the sister of Senate President's chief of staff. Um, so you see this revolving door everywhere in Harrisburg. That's Those who are supposed to be regulating the industries coming directly from that industry. It's, and then you also a have legislators then who retire and become lobbyists. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which is a huge pay raise. <laughs> it's, it's it's really the logical thing for most of them to do in the moment, um, which is really sad. So we have 10 minutes left in our show. If you're just tuning in, this is the People Power Lunch Hour, and I am having a great conversation with our two guests uh, who are with the March on Harrisburg, Michael Pollack, who's the executive director, and Emmy DeChico, who is the communications director, and they've been engaged in a campaign to get money out of politics they are trying to get two bills passed, one that is going to stop gerrymandering and the other is going to end uh, gifts for legislators. And in the last 10 minutes, I just want to talk about how people can get involved if they're listening and watching and they want to join this campaign. You have some citizen lobbying coming up and you also have a toolkit that's on your website can you tell people how they can get involved in what you're doing if they want to also stop money out of politics? Absolutely. Um, this is an organization that there are several ways to get involved. Um, we do have 15 days of lobbying, of citizen lobbying at the state capitol in Harrisburg um, to attend any of those dates. Um, our full calendar is online on marchonharrisburg.org slash events, and you can RSVP to attend any of our events to lobby in Harrisburg. Um, and um, just on that note, what if one of the questions is on your side is like, what if I've never lobbied before? What if it's my first time? You know, because there might be some people who are first timers out there. You'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, yeah. I should say more. We're, 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 we'll train you when you show up in the morning. We, uh, you, we, you'll be paired with somebody who's experienced. We're not going to hang you out to dry or, or leave you alone in the Capitol. And what basically goes on uh, uh, on during like a typical lobbying day? Um, a typical lobbying day, we will meet all of our lobbyists um, at 9 a.m. in the cafeteria. We'll go over everything. Um, again, all of our legislation, all of the full bills are also on our website, marchonharrisburg.org slash bills. So you can review those before you attend. But we'll go over everything. Um, we set the schedule for the day, divide into teams, again, pairing anyone who has not lobbied before or um, who hasn't lobbied on these bills before um, with people who are more experienced. Um, but again, we all were first timers not so long ago. Um, and then we just sort of go throughout the day. We have meetings. Um, session is starts at 11 or 1. It's like 11 on Mondays and 1, one. on Tuesdays. Yes. And then they mix that up every now and then. So the that's when all the legislators yeah. head down to the House um, to call votes and do that sort of thing. Um, but we take meetings in between that um, and just sit down with legislators and talk about the bills, trying to gather co-sponsors and trying to have them apply pressure to hold a hearing or hold votes or call a vote. Um, so that is our citizen lobbying. So anyone can get involved to attend one or multiple days of lobbying. We do carpooling. So if you sign up on our website, um, or RSVP, we can find a ride for you as well. Um, beyond that, there's a lot of, let me say, so there's lobbying, there's our march, um, for anyone who wants to actually get out and take a couple steps with us. We have a 36 mile march from November 10th through the 12th in Lancaster, followed by rallies in civil disobedience, the 13th and 14th, again, at the Capitol. So those are sort of the big, exciting actions that people can get involved in. But beyond that, there's a lot of work that goes into in between all of that. Um, we operate on a committee system of a dozen or so committees. Um, so for anyone who wants to actually get involved in the organizing element, we're always inviting people to cut in. Um, so if you're interested in communications and media, or if you do want to be a member of legislative team, or on the art team, or on outreach, or any of these other things that we have to do in between all of the all of the actions. So definitely sign up on marchinharrisburg.org, um, and we will reach out to get people brought on. Sounds good, and they have a really great toolkit, which explains things that people can do from home um, who are also interested. I think one of the, the most basic things with every campaign is like to educate yourself, right? Yes. Like, look up your district. See how it's shaped. <laughs> Look who's 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 in it. Who's representing you? Check their voting records. You know, find what out what gifts have they received. 
Yeah. Where can you look up what gifts they've received? How do you find that info? Uh, so interestingly, so we have transparency right now, right? Um, legislators have to report what they accept if it's over $250 or $650 for transportation. So technically, all that information is available um, if you go to Pennsylvania's state website and you go to the Ethics Commission. Um, within that, you go to the e-library and you can look up your representative's um, financial statement interest forms. That said, the Ethics Commission has admitted, or not even admitted, they've just you know disclosed that they don't have the manpower to upload all of the financial interest forms. So some get lost. Um, and beyond that, what's incredibly frustrating about the, this system is that they're all uploaded as separate PDFs. So there's no way to cross-reference. So if you were looking up through that, uh, through the state website, if you were trying to look up how much, you know, one particular um, lobbying group has given, there's no way to cross-reference, um, which is why we need gifts limitations because transparency doesn't really exist. That said, you can look on, on that website. And on our website, we actually do detail a lot of the gifts that legislators have accepted um, as well. Wow, that that's really interesting that they don't have all of the things up there. Yeah, <laughs> can't a lobbyist gift them a little helper to come and upload <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> the documents? Yeah. There's a really intentional uh, that that's intentional um, yeah. <laughs> that it's not easy to find out who's taking what yeah. from who. Uh, that's the nature of corruption. It always wants to hide. Um, corruption never wants to be exposed. So one of the greatest uh, exposers of corruption, they call themselves the Sunlight Foundation, because if you shine sunlight onto corruption, it kind of shrivels away and, and tries to hide, because corruption always knows that it's wrong. Um, and, and it really does everything in its power to not be seen. Wow. Well, I wish you luck on your next journey, on your trip. We'll be checking in with you, and maybe you can give us a call while you're on the road, and we'll be checking in with those actions to make sure you guys are all okay. Uh, can you give our listeners the dates of um, the the march um, when you will be doing that uh, from Lancaster to Harrisburg and let them know how they can uh, get on your website or follow you on social media? <laughs> sure. Um, so we will be marching um, from Friday, November 10th through Sunday, November 12th um, from Lancaster to Harrisburg. It's just 36 miles, so it's a short one. Um, and then we will be at the Capitol the 13th and 14th um, with rallies, um, with arrestable and non-arrestable actions. Um, so at the Capitol building, all that information is on our website on marchonharrisburg.org. You can find us on Facebook on, with March on Harrisburg um, and on Twitter with NPA Corruption. All right. Is there anything else you want to tell our listeners before we wrap up? Um. It cannot be overstated how broken the political system in Pennsylvania is, especially in Harrisburg, and how much chaos and suffering result from that. Um, when every single decision is distorted by corruption, it, it just it affects everything. You know, you get a state where we produce 1% of the world's greenhouse gases. You get a state where we're about to default on our budget. You get a state where we can't fund basic services. And it really all gets traced back to just the atmosphere of dysfunction in <laughs> Harrisburg. So we really need all hands on deck um, to correct the, our, our ship of state. So you hear that? This issue affects everybody here in Philly and even in South Jersey. Um, you know, contact your legislators. Let them know that this is an important issue um, if you feel that way. And, you know, follow our folks here, Michael Pollack, who is the executive director of March in Harrisburg, and Emmy DiTico, who is the communications director. Thank you so much for joining us on the People Power Lunch Hour. You can check them out on the marchonharrisburg.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the People Power Lunch Hour. We'll be back next week with an all-new episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to watch this episode and all of our past episodes of the People Power Lunch Hour, you can check out our website at phillycam.org. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber. Thanks for listening and watching.